The bear market is here. What are you going to do? The bear market is here. Stocks dropped 20% off of the highs, putting us in a bear market. I'm just going to turn my microphone up here. Not my microphone, but my headphones. I can hear myself a little bit better. But now, what are you going to do, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to the bear market. We've seen this happen back in March of 2020. Everybody talked about what they would have, could have, should have done. But now that we're seeing a repeat of the market crash, what are you going to do? What are you planning? Call in. Y'all got the number. The number is at the bottom of the screen. But we're going to have a live conversation if you want to call in or if you want to sit back and just chat it up and just get in the chat box. Let's do that today. We're talking about the bear markets here. How are you going to navigate and hold that bear horns? All right. But if you haven't done so already, I know what time it is. Go ahead and make sure. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell icon. Hit that like, comment, and share button. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and children, my ladies, you are now tuned into the Investor Show. As always, this is your gracious host, the Prince of Investing, Prince Dice, coming to you guys and girls live all the way from the beautiful city and state of Denver, Colorado. Don't forget to hit that like, subscribe, comment, and share button. And as always, I don't have a lot of time, and I definitely know you guys and girls don't have a lot of time, so we're going to jump straight into it. Ladies and gentlemen, the bear market is here. What are you going to do about it now that the bear market is here? You can call in live. I think this number, what this number is right here. It is 856-357-84. Let me show you. 8447. Let me make sure y'all. Let me hook myself up together for people that may want to call in live. All right, y'all give me one second. Let me get on here. Where are we at on here? I just saw you. There we go. Yeah, there we go. We are connected there. And make sure I got the right number. Yes, the number is 856-357-8469. It's on the screen, too, if you want to call in and talk about it. This bear market is here. What do you want to do about it? Let's see what y'all say in the comments before we get into it. Randy Johnson. What's going on, Randy Johnson? He in the building. That's my guy. What's going on, Randy? He said he's going to hit the, hit the, <laughs> the edges. Working the edges. <laughs> All right, Wayne. What's going on, Wayne? Wayne says, hello, Prince. Wayne, what's going on, man? Thanks for tuning in. Al, that's my guy, Al. He's always in the bill. He said, Prince of Investment. Yes, sir. Let's get into it. So, ladies and gentlemen, we got a couple of things that we got going on. So, we've seen a transition happen. We got value stocks and we got growth stocks. For the longest, ladies and gentlemen, we saw, uh, let me know if y'all can hear me pretty good, too. I want to make sure y'all can hear me good. For the longest we have is the value stocks have been underperforming while the growth stocks has been having all the fun, right? The value stocks have been underperforming while the growth stocks have been having all the fun, right? So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, we have value stocks versus growth stocks. Uh, let me see. Uh, Al here says, put the number in the ticker. Let me go ahead and put this number in the ticker here so y'all can see as this coming across um, this nice, beautiful Sunday afternoon. I've been gone for a while. I think this is my first live since getting back to Denver from Boston. So, you know, I've been wanting to do this, talk about this bear market that we're in. You know, let's see here. Let me make sure I got this in the ticker so y'all can see this. All right, here we go. So the number is going across the bottom. If you want to call in and talk to me, tell me what you think. I know your portfolio is probably looking ugly right now, but we're going to go through it. So right now, the number is 856-357-8469. So ladies and gentlemen, value stock versus growth stocks. Growth stocks are things like technology. They did extremely well. They made me look like a genius in 2019, 2020, and even in 2021. But when 2022 rolled around, you start to see a shift. Crypto is down. Value stocks are starting to hold their value a little bit more. Growth stocks, the technology stocks are getting beat up. You're seeing uh, the only thing that's making, I mean, everybody across the world is getting obliterated. The only thing that's hot right now on the market is you're seeing gold kind of hold its value. You're seeing uh, oil, oil and gas, the energy sector is doing its thing. XLE, that's the energy sector. Energy sector is doing good. All the other 10 sectors of the market are doing horrible. Well, not horrible. This is doing bad. It's having a bad year. But ladies and gentlemen, this is nothing new. We saw this back in March of 2020. What are you going to do? I wish I had that, that whole Hogan thing. What are you going to do uh, when the hoaxer goes wild on you? What are you going to do when the bear goes wild on you? Because in a bull market, when the market is going up, everybody's a genius. Everybody got memes. Oh, look at my 
Coinbase account, look at my crypto.com account. Everybody wanted to buy. Everybody wanted to jump in during the bull market. Last year, when the market is doing well, everybody wants a piece. This is the time that you should want a piece, ladies and gentlemen. This is the time you should want to get in. So, no, I mean, but now here's the, here's the, uh, the tricky part where we'll get into that later. I don't want to get into that. But the growth stocks, these are your technology stocks, your things like Amazon, Google, Facebook, the FANG stocks. FANG stands for Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, right? These are the stocks that was the hot boys on the market for the last couple of years. And those things like the value stocks, like your Coca-Cola, uh, most of your consumer staples, your Procter & Gamble, nobody wanted them. They was getting 5%, 10% a year. Apple was getting 10, 15, 20% a year. Everybody wanted to do it, right? So nobody wanted to get into the value stocks. Everybody wanted to grow stocks. So now that you're seeing the tides are turning with the growth stocks are getting obliterated, Right now, ladies and gentlemen, S&P 500 from the year to date, meaning starting from January now, S&P 500 is down 18%. The Dow Jones is down 14% and the NASDAQ is down 28%. So most of those fame growth stocks were in the NASDAQ. Those are the ones that are getting obliterated right now. So you're seeing those value stocks starting to hold their value. They're not doing as well, but they're holding their value a whole lot better than a lot of those apples and uh crowd strikes or whatever but the energy sector is is doing good now let's go here this is the next thing that people always text me and they dm me they talk about or whatever they always turn around and say prince um you know oh my god stock market is crashing i'm going to move my money into my savings account and let it sit there for a while then i'm going to jump back into the market see what i don't like about that is one you are insinuating that you can time the market you're one of these three people that I'm going to list a little bit later. Timing the market is one of the most idiotic things I think you can do. Prince, why do you think it's an idiotic thing? Because history has shown you. I met, set back, watched, talked to, podcasted with, listened to millions and millions. Well, not millions, but a few billionaires, right, in an investing world. Guy, uh, I can't even think of Jeff's last name. Jeff, I just saw him a couple of days ago. Billionaire bond kings guy, billionaire real estate guys, billionaire stock market guys, billionaire private equity guys. And these guys would tell you, man, I even Buffett, I just saw him two, three weeks ago. He would tell you, I cannot time the market. I don't know when the peak is. I don't know when the valley is. So if you're talking about, I'm going to move my money out when it's bad, then I'm going to jump it back in when it's good. You are insinuating that you can do what, the best investors in the world cannot do. And if you can do that, there are millions, if not billions of dollars waiting for you on Wall Street, right? If you got a crystal ball and you can time the market, that's what you're doing right now. People are like, oh, I'm going to take my portfolio and I'm going to throw it all into the G fund. I'm going to throw all my money into my money market or my savings account. Then I'm going to jump back in. No, that's insinuating that you can time the market. Now, let's go down to these three types of people. Now, here's DCA. DCA, that's dollar cost averaging. You guys and girls know what that is. That's a set amount of money that you put in every month and you forget about it, right? It's a certain amount of money. Let me tell you how I am playing this situation, right? You take me, been in the military. I have a 401k called a thrift savings plan. What I do, I have, a, I don't know, like 10, 11% of my income goes into that every single month, right? It goes in, it's been 10% of my base pay has been going there every single month. So what I do is I turn around when we have market corrections and bear markets come on, I log in, I up my contribution by one or 2%. I up my contribution by one or 2% and forget about it. Now, when the bull starts to return and the bull is now going crazy, then I may lower my contribution during a bull market, but I up the contributions during the bear. I'm not going to go in there and try to be a ooh, ooh, move here, there. I just leave it in the small cap and the large cap, and I forget about the rest. That person is going to win. I keep the same allocation. People are saying, why would you do that? Why would you keep putting your money into a market that's following? No, duh. You want to buy it when the price is going lower. You're getting a discounted value, right? And you will win over the long term. I've done this in 2020. I look like a genius in 2021. I've done this... Um, in 2008, 2009, when I kind of started to get into investing and it worked out miracles for me and it is time proven. Dollar cost averaging in a time frame like this is you're always going to win. 
the person who's jumping in and out the market, even if you did pick the peaks and the valleys, you still won't beat the person who was dollar cost averaging. So that's another thing to think about. Here are the three types of people, right? There are three types of people. You're going to have three types of people. Here, you might hear yourself in here. One, you're going to have the person who puts their money on the sideline as they wait for the perfect time, right? You're going to put your uh, money on the sideline and wait for the perfect time, man. I'm just put my, I'm gonna just tuck mine in. I'm just gonna put mine in the savings account and wait till it gets better. That's going back to insinuating you can time the market. That person there usually ends up getting. Uh, I had buddies who got millions of dollars. They said, "Prince, what I should do with these millions of dollars? I don't know about the market. I want to wait until it drops, and I want to then I'm gonna just jump in." And guess what? That was back in 2015. He missed the whole bull market. Missed the whole bear market. Then he decided, you know what, Prince? <laughs> Here it is. I had a buddy back in 2015. He had about a million dollars. And he was like, well, Prince, you know, single guy, young guy. And he said, Prince, I don't know, man. Uh, the market seems to be collapsing right now. I'm going to wait till it gets better before I put my money in. If you're coming in, I see that we got 17, 18 people live right now. Go ahead and hit that like, subscribe, comment, share button. Give a thumbs up if you are in here. If you want to call in and talk, it is 856 357 eight, four, six, nine. So anyway, he tells me, Prince, um, I got my money in the market. I don't want to put it into the market right now. Right. And I said, why you don't want to put it into the market? He said, well, I don't know. The market is not doing so good right now. And I said, okay, so guess what? He missed the whole bull market from 2015 all the way to 2020. Right. Then when 2020 came and the bottom fell out the market because of the pandemic, he said, well, see, Prince, it's a good thing I didn't invest because I could have, you know, uh, lost my money. I don't want to do it right now. He didn't want to do it. He waited. What's the rebound? Because you got to think about it. When the market when when the market hit the bottom in March of 2020, it had got back higher than it was before by September, meaning only six months of a bad market lasted. So when the market gets back to where it's going, he's like. Oh, man, it turned around so fast. I need to get into this market. I could have purchased so much stuff. So he jumps head first into the market, comes in September 2020, right? Now you look at uh, September 2020, end of 2020, beginning of 2021. Now you look at it now, it's like, hey, here we are again, going back to the lows we had before. So even with trying to time the market, even if you did peak, even if he did pick the peaks in the valleys, he still would have been better off dollar cost averaging. So you got the one person who's going to try to sit their money to the sideline and wait for the perfect time. And they end up underperforming because they end up having their money in a savings account and getting 0.06 or might be in a money market account and getting a whopping 1% or whatever. But they're missing out. They missed out on those 20% years, those 30% years that was happening in the market. A million dollars that made 20%, that's $200,000 that you missed out on. Three years of compounding at 20 percent. You're talking about, I'm, you know, if my math is correct, almost about a half a million dollars that he missed out on. Right. Trying to wait for the perfect time to get into the market. If you wait on the perfect time, you'll see when you can time the market. Number two, you got the person who says, hey, I'm going to pick the bottoms. I'm going to just sit on the sideline. I'm going to just pick the bottom of the market. Then I'm going to jump back in when everything is doing well. That whole jump back in thing in, you cannot pick the bottom right now. It's happening right now. Back in March of 2020, I didn't know what the bottom was. I tried to find a bottom. I'm like, is this the bottom? We went a little bit lower, a little bit lower, a little bit lower, a little bit lower. And when the market start to turn around, when it turns around, it turns around fast. The market turn when it when it hits that bottom and turns around, it's fast. You don't know what the bottom is at until it is gone. You don't know what the peak is at until it is gone. So some people think, hey. I'm going to be the bottom picker. I'm going to just wait till the market crash, buy everything. When it goes up, I'm going to sell it. Then I'm going to buy everything. That person, even if they pick the pick the bottoms, they will do better than the person on the sidelines, but they will underperform DCA. The third person is going to be the person who's going to be slow and steady, put the same amount of money in every single time. Keep it. I'm going to keep my contributions going. And then I'm going to add a little bit more. Now, when the market goes down, I'm going to, I was putting in $200 a month. Now, let me put in $250. Now, let me put in 300, right, in the bottom of the market. Everybody wants to talk investment advice. Everybody wants an investment advisor when the market is doing well. But when it's doing bad, now you got hot hand Betty. I'm going to get into hot hand Betty here quick. Here's hot hand Betty. Here's the number four person. Hot hand Betty. 
This is something that I made up myself. Hot hand Betty, right? You might hear yourself. Uh, hot hand Betty. This is hot hand Betty, y'all. This is what hot hand Betty does. They see stocks are down right now. They see crypto is down right now. But they see real estate is up. So guess what the hot hand Betty does? They run to the real estate market. You know what, man? Man, you know what? Yeah, my stocks ain't doing too good. My crypto ain't doing too good. But I made $100,000 off my house. Man, what if I'd have had two houses? What if I go build up my house, fix up my house or whatever, right? What if I go get a rental property? They run to the hottest market. They run to whoever got the hot hand. They are there running to real estate when real estate is hot, right? Now, what's going to happen? We know that the, the ties will shift. Stocks will become hot. Real estate will cool off. Now, I mean, it's going to crash, but it will cool off. Then they'll be trying to run to here. Now, in the stock market, this is hot hand Betty does inside of the stock market. Y'all ready for it? This is what hot hand Betty does inside of the stock market. Hot hand Betty inside of the stock market, they're the ones that sell off all of the growth stocks, all of the growth stocks, and then they go out and buy a bunch of oil. See, this is the thing about going about, even though oil is doing good, the reason why oil is so dangerous, scaling oil right now, which, which I'm doing is I'm buying it, selling a little bit, buying it, selling it as it goes up, as it maintains, because it's the only thing that's making money right now. This is the dangerous thing about oil and gold. This is what the hot hand Betty is running to. Commodities, oil, and um, what is the other one? Commodities, oil, and gold are the only ones that's really making money. And savings account. Keep that in mind. Here's a gym, y'all. As the market, as interest rates will continue to climb, savings accounts usually will climb too. So savings start to make a little bit more money too. So cash, people have their money in cash. They do better than what the stocks are doing. But, you know, this is not going to happen over the long term. We know that gold, it will be it will flatline and it will spike during economical uncertainty. Oil. I was not a big fan of oil. Everybody knows that if you talk to me, man, oh, you crazy. Everybody's going electric. Why would I get oil? Right. But at the end of last year, I was watching oil very closely. And then when I I watch oil. I noticed the economical times that we were having with high inflation, things going on in Russia. It was a playback of the late 90s. I mean, the late 70s, early 80s, like 81. I was looking back, looking at the high inflation that we had in the early 80s. What did we do? And I saw during that time frame as interest rates were climbing, went all the way up to 19, 19.99% in 1981. That pushed uh, us into a recession. That's why I made the episode that if you haven't paid attention about a month or two ago that said, hey, is a recession necessary in order to fix inflation? Is a recession necessary to fix an inflation? Right. The reason I did that, because I went back and I studied from 81 what happened in 1981 when interest rates went to 19.99 percent when they were uh, experiencing stagflation, when they had high unemployment and high inflation. And the interest rates went up so high that it pushed them into a recession, right? So when I looked at this and I looked what did very well at that time, oil did immaculate. I started to look into oil. Uncle James came on the podcast and, you know, he started talking about oil. I started looking into oil. Oil did pretty well. But the thing about it is oil spikes, gold spikes, oil spikes. Once everything gets fixed, it goes back down. I don't want to be caught. I want to catch the spike, but I don't want to go back down part. Not that I'm trying to time the market. I'm just trying to ride the market, right? Ride these hot hands. But hot hand better. You got to be careful. You can't be saying, oh, look at oil prices. I'm dumping everything in the oil because this will get fixed and oil will go back down. Gold will go back down. You know the midterm elections are coming in at the end of the year and every politician, what's going to be on their plate is to fix these doggone oil prices. And I don't want to be the guy holding a bunch of oil stocks when every the number one thing that's going to be on every politician's plate is oil prices, gas prices, gas prices, right? So let me see what y'all say in these comments before we're going to go to uh, finding the deep sales. Where are these deep sales? Let me see what y'all say in these comments. You want to call in and talk? Y'all know the number. Oh, y'all say I lost sound. One second, one second, y'all. Make sure my sound is good. Testing. Oh, there we go. Uh, y'all let me know if y'all cannot hear me. Check my sound. Y'all let me know if y'all can now hear me.
Timothy McGlean. McGlean? What's going on, Timothy? He says, hi, what's going on, Timothy? Thank you for tuning in. Max B said, I lost sound, but I see he came back in and said, he said, you're good, King. Appreciate it. Um, Wayne says, sound is good. All right. Uh, okay. Al is saying, sound is good. Okay. Okay. B Mac, what's going on? He said, what's up, Prince? Great info. B Mac, what's going on? That's my guy right there, man. Brian Mac, what's going on, Brian? Nice to see you. Nice to see you. My guy LLJ says, what's crazy to me? Warren dropped a few billion in it. Oil. He did, right? He did drop a few billion when he brought uh what's that company called? You know, uh Occidental Oil or something like that or whatever. But finding these deep sales, ladies and gentlemen, is very easy. Very, very easy right now to be able to find you a good sale. Now, here's the thing you don't want to get caught up with chasing yesterday prices, right? You don't want to get caught up with, you know, something that used to be hot, something that was hot back in the day. So my thing is, I never was a hot oil person, but I ride the oil as it's going up. Um, if I hold something, then it's fine. Now, here it is. Number one. Number one. Y'all ready for it? Here's the gym. Selling covered calls. Selling covered calls. In the option trading world, I talk to all the people about option trading. I get all the people who tell me, hey, man, I'm buying and selling options and then Option trading is not as simple as a lot of people would like to believe, right? So this is what it is. The winners in the option trading game are people who sell options. For prime example, right now, Apple is at $137. 100 shares of Apple right now will cost a roughly about $14,000, roughly to say. $14,000 for 100 shares of Apple. So what this person is going to do, Let's take a look. Let's let's walk through it, y'all. Let's walk through it. It's, it's Sunday. Let's get through it. We don't want to sit here and talk about it. Let's go through it. I'm going to share my stream. I'm, I'm popping it up right now. I'm going to show y'all selling options, how people make money from selling their own stocks they own in their portfolio. In order to sell options, you must own 100 shares. Say that with me. You must own 100 shares, not 100 shares of a penny stock that nobody want. You want to get 100 shares of stuff that has a high volume that people trade every day. Now, you know, you go out there and get a penny stock for 100 shares, then say, hey, I want to sell options. It doesn't work as sweet. So let's take this. Think about it. Here we go. Apple. So let's go to Apple. I'm pulling up the option chain on Yahoo Finance. I'm going to bring you all over in a second. I'm going to share my screen. Anybody can get to this. I'm on yahoofinance.com up under the options chain. I'm going to see how hard that options chain is to read. Give me one second. So here we go. I'm pulling up the screen here. Boom. Make sure my, let me get this stuff out of the way. I don't want it to look too clunky on y'all. All right. So here's the option, the option chain. So prime, prime example right now, Apple is at $137.59. You go out, somebody goes out, buys 100 shares. That's $13,700 what you're going to spend. Let's say 14 grand. Now you own 100 shares of Apple. Number one, Prince, why did you use Apple? Apple right now is 32% off of its year-to-date high. 32%. Apple stock has dropped. I think it was at like 180 some dollars. It is 32% off of its high. It's a company, a trillion dollar company that is so big that I think that um, in economical times like this, I don't want to be on a little itty bitty small cap stock because I don't know if they're going to make it through during a hard economical time. But somebody like Apple, trillion dollar company, I'm going to tell you how I drilled down and found Apple too. Don't take a rocket science, right? So right here, you see the strike price. It's a little bit hard to read on um, Yahoo, but you know, looking at it, right? Let's take, let's say, what, what date do they have pulled up here? Okay, this is March 27. Let's go out a month. Let's go out to July 1st. Let's see what the chain look like on July 1st. No, okay. So this is the July 1st chain, right? So right here. So people right now, 
let's say if you brought Apple for one hundred and thirty seven dollars. Right now, the last price as of Monday. You could sell you could sell somebody right now. You can go in. You got 100 shares of Apple. You could go in and do a buy right. What is called a buy right. And you can sell a call on apps uh, on Apple and say, hey, somebody will pay me five hundred and eighty five dollars to be able to buy my Apple stock for one hundred and forty dollars. Right now, you can sell. You can do a buy right and say, hey, you know what? If Apple hits one hundred and forty dollars by July 1st. You can buy them for one hundred and forty dollars. Not I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You can buy my Apple stock for one hundred and forty dollars all the way to July 1st. Right. So if you only pay one hundred and thirty seven dollars a piece, if the stock does hit one hundred and forty dollars, you made three hundred dollars. If the person executes, you made three hundred dollars on top of that. When you give somebody this right, they're going to pay a premium. You see this right here? It says $585. That means that you hold Apple stock. You buy a bunch of Apple stock at $137. You sell the right for somebody to be able to buy for $140 all the way to July 1st. Let's say July 1st roll around. Apple stock is now $150. A person executes and says, hey, give me your stock. I'm going to buy them from you for $140. I pay $137. You brought them for me in a hunt for $140. I made 300 bucks on top of that in order to exit in order to get this contract. I charge you $500 to get this contract 500 plus 300. That's $800 that you made off of $1,400. I mean, 14, 14 grand right now on top of that, let's say if Apple stock is not at $140, let's say if Apple stock is now at $130 come July 1st, guess what? You was able to keep five hundred dollars. So if the stock goes up, you make money. You lose your stock, but you make money. If the stock goes down in price or stays the same in price, you collect a premium. You guys and girls get what I'm saying? This is why what people like to do. Let me see here. What is Johnny? What's going on, Johnny? Thank you for tuning in. Johnny said, will market continue to crash this week? Um, I think that we're going to be in a cold summer. I don't, uh, for you guys and girls that didn't see what Uncle James was saying, people are expecting the market to be in a turbulent downturn all the way until um, midterms. They think towards August timeframe, we'll start to see the market start to turn around. So, yeah, think about it, ladies and gentlemen. The last time this happened, it only lasted six months. March of last year, it only lasted six months. So you got to think about it. It may not be as long as you think it's going to be. So one thing I want you guys and girls to think about, market downturns don't last long. The longest, on average, most recessions or recessionary periods, when we hit a recession, last 18 months, right? So guess what? It is easy in a down economy, people love to sell. Everybody get panicked, people sell. It's a lot of things that I sold because I was locking in profits, right? So when you look at the option, the seller, the person who owns 100 shares, the reason why most people don't use this strategy is because most people don't have the capital. How many people have 14, 15, 20 grand just to lock away, right? And play options. They don't. Think about it. What is 10% of, you know, you look at 10% of 14,000 is 1,400. 5% is $700. So think about it. Right now, if you had a, you purchase 100 shares of Apple, you purchase 100 shares of Apple, you turn around and sell a 140 July 1st call on it for a $500 premium, you collect $500. Meaning regardless of what happened to the stocks, you will collect and keep $500. Let's say if the stock stays the same, the stock stays the same, you keep the $500 and you keep your stock. In a bear market, people don't expect stocks to do that well. So guess what? They're using 100 shares to be able to make money off of it, make to draw income. Let's say if the stock does well and it shoots up to $1,500. I mean, let's say if it shoots up to $150. You lose your stock at $140, meaning you cash out at $800, $800 within four weeks. Not a bad deal. $200 a week 
and all you did was breathe. They ain't a bad deal. Shout out to that. That's one way. That's one way. Most people that get into options, they don't have fifteen hundred, twenty thousand dollars. So guess what? They love to buy options or use strategies. Strategies are not bad. Use strangles. You know, you got strangles, you got straddles, you got all type of strategies you can use. But the real winners are the people who go out and have own 100 shares or something or 200 shares or 300 shares. People do it on a massive scale. They may own 10 contracts. 10 contracts, that's about a that's about $150,000. They own $150,000, meaning that they're going to make 8 grand in one month. Right? So, that's where big money does cuz think about it, when people have big money, they don't take that much risk. If I'm managing a million dollar account with a million dollar account, I can buy how many shares of Apple. And with a million dollar account, I make 5% off a million dollars. What is 5% of a million dollars? 50 grand, right? If my math is correct, 50 grand. That's 50 grand in four weeks, right? So people who have big accounts, you're like, hey, I don't have to take that much risk. I don't have to be a genius. I can sit back and get high quality things, sell options on them, right? Now, let's get back to my topic. How do you find the deepest sale? The number one way I look at finding the deep sale. Here we go. People who tune in, y'all already know what I'm going to say and do. Let me share my screen again. Let me share the screen again. First, I like to look at all the three major indexes. Small cap in hard times. I don't really mess with small cap companies because I don't know who's going to disappear. Let's look at the major three. The major three, let's go to Google. The major three, Dow Jones. I can look at the ETF DIA. Dow Jones. Type in DIA into Google. I go to year to date. I can tell right now Dow Jones is down 14.5%, almost 15%. Okay. What about the S&P 500? Let's type in SPY. Right? SPY, year to date, down 18%. Okay, so the S&P 500 is beating the Dow on the downside, going down. Now let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ, I already know, is down like 28%. 28%. So now I know the NASDAQ is out of the th top three major ones. It is the one with the deepest sales. So now I want to see what is inside of the NASDAQ. Now let's go to NASDAQ uh, QQQ Holdings. I'll type in QQQ Holdings. Well, I know NASDAQ is the one that got beat up, beat up the most because this is where all the growth stocks are. This is where all the technology stocks. This is where Netflix almost fell off the map. Netflix ain't had nothing to do with inflation. Netflix just got competition. They're not the only game in town. You know, they are the pretty girl in the country that, you know, the country girl that was very pretty. She was a 10 in the country. She moved to the big city to <laughs> she moved to a major city. She moved to New York, L.A., Atlanta. And now she ain't as pretty as she thought she was because there are tons of pretty girls that are out there. Right. Competition. That's just a slang way of kind of explaining that. So anyway, right here, these are the top 10 holders inside of the Nasdaq. You got number one at 12 percent is Apple. That's the allocation coming in. at number two is Microsoft. Number three, Amazon. Number four, Apple, which is, I mean, an alphabet, I'm sorry, which is Google. Number five, Tesla. Number six, Facebook. Number seven is Google again, class A. Navita is coming in at number uh, eight. Pepsi Cola is coming in at number nine. And number 10 is board.com. Number one. Now, now I say, okay, so Apple has the most allocation. Most of the NASDAQ is in Apple, 12%, right? I'm not crazy about Amazon because we know in high inflationary periods, consumer discretionary is doing the worst right now. Consumer discretionary is when consumers, the more money they make, the more they go out and buy, right? Consumer discretion, going to the movies. When people make more money, they'll go to the movies more. They'll go out to eat more. They'll go to the mall and shop more. When people is not as making as much money, they don't go to the movies no more. They might sit at home and watch Netflix. They may not buy as new clothes. They may go to the cleaners and clean something up. That's consumer discretionary. That's where Amazon is at. I'm not keying in on that, right? So number two, you got Microsoft. Microsoft, Apple is at number one. They're going neck and neck. I look at them. I say, okay, Apple, Microsoft, and Microsoft. Apple, 
and Microsoft are the top two in the NASDAQ. So let's go do a little research here. All right, Google. You know, I'm using Google because I know anybody can look this up. Apple. Apple stock. Right? It's at $137 today. I go to year to date. So year to date, that means this this year, Apple was at $182 starting off the year. It went from $182 and it has dropped $44 this year, right? $44 drop on Apple, which is a 32% drop from its peak earlier this year. Meaning that if Apple just got back to where it was in the beginning of the year, that is a 32% return. I'll take that 32% in one year on a company that's a trillion dollars, a market cap of $2.23 trillion, right? <clears throat> Another one I like is JP Morgan. But let's take a look at Microsoft. MSFT. Microsoft is right now at $252. Year to date, at the peak of this year, Microsoft has dropped $82, right? Mm -hmm. So let me do, let's see what the percentage on that is. That's going to be 82. If my math is correct. Make sure I got it right. Pull up my calculator. 82. Uh, turn this thing off. That's 82 times 100 divided by 256. And don't be comments saying, Prince, I could have done that 10 times faster, man. You All you had to do was just do 9 times 3 plus the it's 32% as well. So Microsoft and Apple are both 32% off of their highs from the beginning of the year. Microsoft, too, is a $1.89 trillion company. So I would rather take a risk on a trillion dollar company just going back to what it was before in a bear economy. Now, let's go back, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go back five years and see what did Microsoft look at this. When we blew out Microsoft before the pandemic hit, it was at $183. It dropped down to $137 in March of 2020. March 20, 2020, Microsoft was at $137. Since then, ladies and gentlemen, it has doubled. Now, let's say within six months, within six months, um, Microsoft went from $137. Let's go back to not even, um, what's is that? September of that year, Microsoft went from 137 to 214. 137 to 214 almost doubled in value from its bottom of the pandemic. Let's go back. Let's look at Apple. What did Apple do that time? Do uh, do during Apple? Now, ladies and gentlemen, we always know past performance is not an indicator of future performance. Historic performance is not a future of uh, not an indicator of what it would do in the future. So anyway, right here, March of 2020. Um, Apple was at 80 bucks. You know, it did that stock split. Apple was sitting around $80. Pandemic come through, boom. Apple dropped all the way to $57. You know, nope, nope, nope. It dropped to make sure I got it right. I want to make sure it got it dropped down to $61. So you already know Apple doubled since then. So in six months from March all the way to September, what did Apple do? It went from $61 all the way to 108 or 106, almost doubled itself back then in a six month period. This is why I remember this, how it happened back in March of 2020 when everything went on sale and everybody's like, oh, yeah, everybody getting slaughtered. But guess what? The NASDAQ always has the most volatility. So, Jim, the NASDAQ always the technology stock has the most volatility. So this was the time to say, hey, you know what? This is a place I can start to go. This is how you're finding those deep sales without taking a whole lot of things on it. Let's see what Dark Carmen got to say. Dark Carmen says, let me blow this up a little bit. He said, I, I think he said, I mean, I think he's trying to say, I wish. I wish I could uh, buy a few million dollars worth of some of these top tech stocks. Yeah, you know. You could, well, it all depends on your money. You could margin. I'm not going to go crazy about margin, all that good stuff like that. But you know what? Guess what, Dart? This happened in March of 2020. You could have done it in March of 2020. And it is repeating here in May of 2022. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? This bear is going to happen again. These things happen, right? 
Wayne dropped the gems. What's going on, Wayne? What's going on? So right there, now, Prince, when it's times of uncertainty, I only want the big boys. I'm sorry. I only want the big companies. I'm not going to go for the small rinky dink in the way type companies that are trying to make it. No, I need somebody what I like to call for sure, for sure companies, companies that I know that are solid in the game that I ain't got to worry about. Right. That's what I want to do. Let me see what y'all say in the comments. He said potential knowledge is powerful. Yes, knowledge is. But you always say knowledge is not powerful. Action is powerful. Right. Action is powerful. Everybody loves to say, man, in 2008, man, I would have brought up all the houses. Man, I would have brought everything. I would have brought all the land. Man, I would have brought all the houses. Even Buffett two weeks ago said, man, back in March of 2020, we missed out on it. And I told you guys and girls why Buffett missed on 2020. Because Berkshire does very well in times of economical depression and recession. What they do is when companies experience hard times, this is when people like to sell their companies. People like to walk in and sell their companies at hard times. So what happened is in March of 2020, Jay Powell wasn't playing that. That was Jerome Powell. Jerome Powell came in and said, screw this. Look, we got PPP loans. We're going to send out money to everybody. So Buffett and them and his investors, it dried up that opportunity for them to go in and be able to get companies for very, for very cheap. Right. Max B, he said, oh, gee, what's going on, Max B? He says, uh, OG, could some go get QQQ or pick individuals since they're down so much? Yeah, so what happens is it all depends on how much money you got. If you got $20,000, then maybe you can look into maybe selling a call, you know, uh, not selling a call, but, you know, by doing buy rights, selling options, right? If you only got $1,000, only got $200, maybe a little smaller, smaller amounts of money, then you might better go buy the QQQ index, right? Uh, if you got a little money and you were a little bit more risky, you can do the TQQQ. That's the T. That's the QQQ on steroids. TQQQ. That is a bullish uh, ETF that tracks the the Nasdaq. If you want a little bit more riskier, so some people I don't have a lot of money, but I want to get that big bang to the upside. Then you can look at bullish TQQQ. Right. So think about it. Knowledge is not power. The ability to act on knowledge is power. Everybody know it. Right. So there we go. You're right, Wayne. Wayne said action is powerful, very powerful. So it all depends, ladies and gentlemen. Some people I look at all of the ones across the market and I want to see what is on sale the most. So what I look at the three major indexes, I look at, OK, out of everybody it's usually going to be the Nasdaq. It's going to be the technology stocks that's going to get hit the hardest during economical downturns. But if you line up the Nasdaq. Versus the S&P 500, the NASDAQ usually outperforms the S&P 500 over time. But in the meanwhile, it's going to be wild. It's going to be up and down and up and down and up and down. Look at ARK Investments, Kerry Woods. Kerry Woods was a superstar two years ago. Everybody wanted ARK Investments. Everybody wanted ARK Investments. Now ARK Investments are... <laughs> right so here we go right here lj what's going on lj he says um vu is one of my picks i like swppx over vu vu is a vanguard s p 500 i personally like swppx prince why do you like swppx swppx and vu track the same thing one is with vanguard the other one is with goldman sachs not goldman sachs i'm um, sorry uh Charles Schwab. One's with Charles Schwab. One is done by Vanguard. The one with Charles Schwab, the VU costs a couple hundred dollars. I think it's like three hundred dollars right now. But the Charles Schwab one is only like sixty bucks. And once you purchase it, you can put ten dollars in it. You could put five dollars in it, three dollars in it. You don't have to have a certain amount. Every time you want to buy that VU, you're gonna need two, three hundred dollars. But you can buy SWPPX over and over for five dollars, ten dollars, whatever you can do. This is the time to up those contributions, ladies and gentlemen. If you're somebody that's tuning in, you're like, man, Prince, you're saying some good stuff, man, but I ain't into investing. Go find a registered investment advisor to manage your funds. Find a registered investment advisor. You can go over to the sec.gov, search by your zip code, find someone who's licensed and registered, call, pick out three of them, talk to them, see who has ideas that matches your ideas. They may look in and go into them. He said, Kathy Woods just dropped $500 million on Coinbase. 
Go, Kathy, go. <laughs> go, Kathy, go. But, you know, she got a bunch of capital. She got to put it to work. A bunch of people gave her money. She got to push it somewhere, right? If you're going to be wrong, stay wrong. <laughs> That's what they always say in the military. If you're wrong, stay wrong. Don't be in here second guessing yourself. Max B said uh, they have the same expense ratio as well. Yes. No, I actually think SWPPX might be beating them. Let me take a look right here. Let me pull it up. I think uh, let's take VU. VU. VU expense ratio, I think it's four or three, one of those. Mm, give me one second. Let me pull this up. Expense ratio. Who is expense ratio is 0 0.01. Okay, it's it's dropped. Okay. It has dropped. It used to be 0 0.03. Okay. So they have dropped. So okay. But now it still doesn't beat my other uh factor of how much it costs, right? And the expense ratios now, uh SWPPX is 0 0.02 and Vanguard is 0 0.01, which is cool. They dropped theirs pretty pretty significantly, which is fine. But here's the difference. Charles Schwab index is $60 right now, right? $60, meaning that every time I want to buy it, it's $60. But the Vanguard ETF is $358 right now. So that's one of the things to look at. Yeah, he said, LOL. Yeah, so right now, if you're an investor, Kathy Woods has gotten billions of dollars to put into the market, Right? Oh, that's my guy right there. That's my guy, Freddie B. What's going on, Freddie B. in the building? What's going on, Freddie B.? Freddie B. said, I'm going to keep buying good company stocks like Apple. Good one. Disney, it's a little shaky. I just awarded one kid. I got to post up a picture um, who won some Apple uh, Disney stocks. We gave away two shares of Disney. Shout out to Ariel, Ariel in D.C., and I can't remember the kid's name here in Denver. Sorry, but y'all got, they got one share of Disney each. So shout out to them. That's for winning the Wesley Learners Book Club uh, at the Boys and Girls Club. The Boys and Girls Club in D.C. and the Boys and Girls Club here. Two kids won. They're going to get Disney shares. So Apple, okay, I can see that. Disney, yeah, pretty good. People are going to get back to it. Walmart, I definitely can see it. Walmart had a massive fall off. Um, Walmart and Amazon, they're kind of in that same arena. They're both in the consumer discretionary. So what I feel like, Freddie B, I feel like your portfolio might be correlating a little bit much to each other, right? So Apple, that's your technology. Disney, that's your that kind of falls upon a consumer discretionary in a way. Walmart and Amazon, those two are on what you call it. Those two are kind of in the same field in a way. They're almost competitors. So that means when your Amazon go up, your Walmart might go down. They might be going against each other. I probably will pick one and roll with it. Uh, the next one you got there is uh, Tesla, and I think WM, I think that's Waste Management, Trash Company. That's a good one. And Tesla. I say Tesla. I could roll with that. I could see that. EV World. But that's the only thing looking at those in this list that you put up, Walmart and Amazon, they're kind of close to each other. They, pro I think they're competitors. I don't want competitors in my uh, portfolio. I don't want two companies fighting each other. I want y'all to go together. <laughs> right? Max B says, what's up with Greenland Price? Just listen to their earnings call, Not Good. Uh, Greenland, I think that was the uh, weed company, right? The CEO was on uh, on this podcast. I had it for a little minute. Now it's a penny stock. <laughs> but you got to think about it. In times like this, small cap companies, small companies get obliterated. These penny stocks, small companies, when things get hard, they really have a hard time. If Tesla, if the trillion dollar companies are having a hard time, what do you think the little small tech companies are having? If Apple is down 30%. These other companies are going to be down about 80%. And I believe Greenland, I think they are the marijuana company. Their CEO was on this company here, cool guy and everything. Um, I had to back away from his company because one thing, military cannot invest in marijuana-related companies. They put that out a couple months ago, so I had to back away from that. But I don't think that Greenland is going to see. I don't think none of those marijuana companies are going to really make no moves until the federal government get up off their behind and legalize marijuana on a national level. I just came back from Boston, Massachusetts. I think marijuana is legal there. Here in Colorado, marijuana is being legal. I think it's legal in California, a good bit of state. Until the federal government comes out and says, hey, marijuana is legal, in order to give those tax breaks to those marijuana companies, I think they're going to kind of be in on the struggle bus.
Wayne says, what's up with AMD? You know what? In one of the portfolios I managed, I just took the profits on AMD. Um, AMD microchip, they've been doing pretty good. I don't know a whole lot about them to say if they're a good buy or not. Uh, but in times like this, I like to go with the big boys, the big trillion dollar companies that are having a big drawback. It's like a rubber band. That rubber band is pulling down. I like to mess with them. AMD has been having an immaculate last five years. I got to say that. Shout out to AMD. So, um, yeah, so I don't have a whole lot to say about that, Wayne. But, you know, they had an immaculate five years. But in times like this, I'm going with the big boys. All right. Let me see what else I want to talk to y'all about before I got up out of here. I have my banners on here. So now people are running around and putting their cash up. People are saying, hey, man, I'm going to put my money into cash. Wait till times get better. Um, you have money market accounts, which are pretty good because as the interest rates started to grow, you're going to see savings accounts kind of return to some type of prominence. As interest rates start to go up, you're seeing like the 30 year fixed mortgage right now is five to five percent. I mean, real estate is going to cool off. I mean, it has to cool off because I will say right now, my mortgage is like twenty five hundred dollars a month. Right. Had I purchased my house, if I purchased my house today, my mortgage would probably be about four thousand five hundred in this economy, which is crazy. Right. I mean, you're talking about doubling my mortgage and you're talking about two, three years. Right. So because guess what? You know, my house is going up two hundred grand plus. Not only that has gone up, the interest rates were two percent. Now they have five going on six percent. So houses are becoming less and less affordable. So when houses become affordable, they're going to dry up that buyer's market in the real estate. It's going to dry the real estate market up. And we got two things going against each other. One, the dryer's pool is going to dry up. Two, we're building houses like crazy. So what we're going to do, we're going to build too many houses and you're going to see houses that are going to be empty. And people that's going to go sell their house, they're going to be trying to sell their house that's like 30 years old. Why would I buy your house 30 years old? When I can go get a new house that's on sale right now, half price off. So I think that, um, you know, real estate is kind of what you call it. But, yeah, so you can look at the place you can put cash, gold in, in economical hard times. You can hide in some gold. You can hide in some. Um, uh, you can hide in some gold. You can hide into money market accounts um, until things get a little bit better. Right. Or even a savings account because interest rates are starting to pick back up. Right. So, yeah, we talked about it. I think I went through everything that I uh, went wanted to go through. We talked about the hot hand, Betty, the three types. We talked about finding those deep markets, uh, finding those deep things. You can get into those leverage uh, S&P 500, SPXL to get that rebound when it comes back on the market. You want to get that big jump, you can get SPXL because that's got a deep price. TQQQ, nice price. Look at TQQQ, right? TQQQ. Y'all type that in, TQQQ. This is the NASDAQ bullish ETF. It is $27 right now. The beginning of the year, it was eighty. It was $85. So right now, if the market goes back to where it's at, this thing is going to quadruple, right? So that's one way you can TQQ. That's a bullish ETF on the NASDAQ. You can do it on the S&P 500 with XPXL, and that's the way to go. Let's go right here. Uh, B Max said, I'm building a position in AMD now and about to add in JP Morgan. That's what I didn't even bring up JP Morgan. JP Morgan was the second one. It is down uh, 37%. People are buying cover calls on it to protect themselves. If the, if the market goes up, they get to sell their calls for a premium. If the market does not go up, they get to collect those premium checks. That's what they're doing there. JP Morgan, it did the same thing as tech companies. It had a nice drawback too. B Mac, if you remember this, write this one down. SPXL. Remember, we was talking about this in 2020, and we was kind of riding and taking money, riding and taking money, riding and taking money. SPXL. Hold on to that bad boy. SPXL right now today is at XPXL today. This is a leverage bullish ETF on the um on the uh, market, uh, on the S&P 500, it says $73 today, right? But you got to think about it. Earlier this year, it was at $145. So right now, SPXL, watch that. It says $73 today. 
I remember sometimes it was at $30 back when March happened. March of last year, I mean, March of 2020 was at $30. It says $70 a day if you get back to where, it's where, where it was when S&P 500 finally get its act together by the end of this year or by next summer, double money. So there we go. <laughs> Big Mac said, I remember. Yes, exactly. That thing we was riding at $30 and it shot all the way up to $140 something dollars. Now that the SP 500 is not doing good, it is now at $73. If you hold on to that bad boy, by the time we get through, by this time next year, you're going to be sitting at how much? You're going to be sitting at how much money? You're going to be sitting at doubling your money. Oh, shout out. Oh, look at this, man. Drop the 20 on me. Look at it. Shout out to. Ella, look at it. Drop it. Too dumb. Thank you for your twenty dollar donation. Thank you for your twenty dollar donation. Thank you for. He said, uh, "Ella G said just a little something for the investor show." Man, I appreciate it, man. Um, you know, twenty dollars. I appreciate that. Thank you for uh, donating to the show. Um, here recently, when I, I'm going, I'm putting together now a book drive that I'm going to do probably later this year. Uh, partner up with some companies. We're going to do a book drive to where. We have a goal of getting the Wesley Learns book series, my book series that I wrote all three books into every kid's hands in America. So that's my next goal to get my books into every kid's kid's hand in America. And my ultimate goal before I leave this earth, I want every kid, once they walk into kindergarten, I want them to be able to have an investment account. An investment account for every kid. As soon as they walk into kindergarten, they should have $50,000 put to them. And they have to do three things when they turn 18 to 20 years old, when they graduate high school, first, graduate high school, two, no criminal record, three, having an acceptance letter from a college. Graduate high school, successful graduate high school, uh, keep a clean criminal record, have an acceptance letter for college. And that, ladies and gentlemen, will rid America of student loan debt and the student loan debt crisis. But I'm going to make that happen before I leave this earth. Yeah, Max B said XPXL dropped this drop hard this year. It's supposed to drop hard. It when when it's going up, if you're going to get all that upside, you best believe you're going to catch that downside because <laughs> it's the bullish side, right? See, I don't. You can get the SQQ. You can bet against the market too, but that's too risky. We don't know, man. Next week the market could just have a whole other attitude. I don't know what Mr. Market does, but the stock market is built to go up over time. And I can't be predicting and trying to catch those bottles. That's what I got to say. Um, okay, so I, I okay, somebody named Stock Market says, should I buy ETFs or individual stocks during the day? Um, the ETFs are they're not going to get you as much return. The individual stocks are going to get you more return, but it's going to be a little bit more riskier. If it was me, it's too many good stocks on the market right now. I would if I would be buying more of individual stocks. Like I would, I would rather have Apple than have QQQ. Then the ETF or the NASDAQ, I would rather have Apple because you got to think about it. The NASDAQ, we just said is off 28%, but Apple is off 32%. So when things turn around, when those indexes go back up, the individual stocks are going to have a bigger rebound. That's just me. Um, Max B said, we need a Wesley gets a credit card book. <laughs> That's a good way. It might come. You know, you never know. We never know. I want to do real estate next. And I'm trying to see how I want to do it, how I want to put together. But, you know, I got to drop these books out uh, out here. That's what, you know, my call and do. That's what I got to think. LJ Ross said, all about serving God. Bless. Appreciate that, man. Definitely. Thank you. You know, here we go. Here we, um, I don't know what that means. Oops, please, that you put it in here. Max B said, if you want to write it down, XPXS is the opposite. Yes, you can write it down with that, but you know, you got to be careful with that one because that bull comes out of nowhere. When that bull turns around, you're going to get burned. It's just harder to be a bear than it is a bull. That's just my impression. Stock market said, thanks. Cool. Hello, Dammy says, stocks not built to go up forever as Japan still hasn't come back from the 90s high. Right. But you're talking about America. Never bet against America. As long as we got the strongest military, I'm never betting against America economically. Right. Yes. I know what happened in Japan. You know what's going on with Japan. But this is America. 
we're not known for nothing but capitalism, right? Now, I believe China is right there with us economically, and it was, I think this slowly will take us over economically over time, maybe not in our lifetime, but yes, you, you're talking about Japan, you're talking about America, who's known for capitalism, who's gotten a head start on everybody, who's a young company, who has the strongest military. As long as we got the strongest military, I'm riding against America. I'm not betting against America. Because hello dumb, if I don't do stocks, what am I supposed to do? If I don't if, if I don't invest, I gotta put it somewhere. I'm gonna be in the same thing. When I'm gonna save it, I gotta find something else to do. Now, granted, we do got private markets. We're gonna talk about private markets too. Yovana says, Great gems. What's going on, Yovana? I think Yovana is out of New York somewhere, if I'm not mistaken. Hopefully that's the right Yovana. Yovana says, Great gems, taking notes. That's what I'm talking about. Um, right here, uh, I can't see name. Ops Blood Glove. I thought those Asian country caps is on market though. Yeah, I don't get into China and stuff like that because they have a they have a dictatorship where their economy is controlled by certain people. I don't have time for all that stuff. You know, they came in and said, "Hey, cryptocurrency, get out of here!" Ain't nobody doing cryptocurrency. They could come in and say, "Hey, we're only going to buy chicken from one spot." They can do that. It's a dictatorship. Or they can get into it with America and say, no, nah, we ain't giving you none of y'all investing y'all money. <laughs> I ain't got <laughs> I ain't got time to deal with all that stuff. I'm like, man, you know, you add an extra layer of foreign, it's called foreign risk. I think it's foreign risk. When you invest into a foreign company because you have foreign governments you have to deal with, right? Most American companies are already global anyway. If China got funny with us right now, where is Tesla going to make his cars? Where's Apple going to make his phones? Where are we going to get our clothes? This shirt I probably got on is probably made in China. This camera that's recording me is probably made in China. This microphone is probably made in China. I know my iPhone is made in China. My mixing board is probably made in China. My laptop is made in The lights I got made in China. So they make everything. We don't make nothing over here. That's one bad thing about our economy. We need to make more things here. But we're so used to paying cheap prices. We want those cheap prices. So we get it made overseas so we can get those cheap prices, but it's going to hurt us in the long run. I said into many politicians, I heard UN ambassadors, White House chief of staffs, got a chance to meet some of these people. And I asked them the same question. Yes, we're enjoying these cheap prices right now, but we know this is going to hurt us in the long run. You know, um, here we go. Wayne says, America. Yeah, don't bet against America. I'm not betting against them. So shout out to all my veterans, B Mac. B Mac was my chief back in the day when I was in the Navy, back special was in Iraq. So shout out to B Mac, y'all. Give him a shout out. So don't shout out to all the veterans. Shout out to all the veterans, the people who currently serving, used to serve, did serve, uncle serve, family serve, because they are the ones. Because guess what? Yeah, we owe a bunch of debt. Yeah, we printing out trillions of dollars but who gonna come check us who gonna tell us don't do that who gonna tell us you know what i mean who gonna come over here and say man y'all stop that <laughs> nobody so hello dummy says i don't bet against america i'm betting against the politics and inflation and the feds but they are america right the power if you if you're talking about going against the fed and the politicians i get what you're saying I don't believe in inflation, but I think the feds are going to have to put us into a recession. This happened in 1981 when interest rates was at 20 percent. Right now, we're at, I think, 2 percent right now, 1 or 2 percent. The Fed fund rate, that thing was at 20 percent in the 80s. Right. You know what I mean? That thing was at the 20s. So they had to put us into it's like one of those things. Cut off your finger to save your hand. Because when those interest rates go up, money becomes hard to borrow. It's probably going to raise inflation, put us into a hard spot to curve inflation. Then when inflation gets curved, they're going to back off the interest rates. That's what they did in the 80s when we was at 14, 15 percent interest rate. Right now, we think it's bad right now with the housing market. Everybody like, man, the housing market uh, interest rates are 5 percent right now. Five going on 6 percent the last time I checked for a 30 year fixed mortgage. Do you know what that was back in 81? It was 16.9%, almost 17%. My dad purchased a house back in 95, and I think he told me he had, it was 10%, and he was happy to have that 10%.
right? He was happy to have that 10%. thought that was my son coming in. He was like, man, I got 10% back in 95. That was a great thing. Double digits was a great thing. In 81, it was 16, 17%. So think about it. We had to do it. Sometimes you got to cut off your finger to save your hand. Oh, Yovana says, nope, she's in Minneapolis. I'm sorry. It's another Yovana. I think that's out of New York or somewhere, but shout out to Minneapolis. I've never been to Minneapolis. Shout out Minneapolis. <laughs> B-Mac said, I'm holding my NIO Chinese position. That's supposed to be like the Chinese version of Tesla. Hey, it's nothing wrong with that. You know, nothing wrong with that. B-Mac says, thanks for the shout out, man. I never forget the people who mentored me and guided me along my way it's a long list but i always y'all give a shout to b uh b mac here like i said they know him since i met him in 08 great mentor of mine especially in the navy those great chiefs that i inspired to be like so shout out to b mac shout out to b mac glad to see you glad to see you doing well and thanks for your support too definitely appreciate it do you know how uh do you know much about business credit yeah i know pretty good you know, I mean, business credit is pretty simple from the basic standpoint. Um, you start a business. You like with me when I use with business credit, I started a business. Um, I got a business checking account, whatever. Then all of a sudden they say, hey, you qualify for a business credit card. I got a five hundred dollar business credit card. You know how the credit card game work. Then they offer you a line of credit. Then it goes from five hundred dollar limit to a thousand dollar limit, twenty thousand dollar limit, thirty thousand dollar limit, things like that. Right. So, yeah, I, that's the basic understanding. I have a business credit. You know, the longer you are in business, the more you qualify for, the more revenue that you bring in, you qualify for. So, yeah, I got that understanding. Max B said, Prince, do you think Jay Powell can land a plane softly or will a small recession come next year? This would I think is uh, Alan Greenspan. Alan Greenspan was a Fed chair back in the 90s and they he became famous because they said he landed the plane softly. So right now they're trying to say, OK, inflation is up here. We're going to bump up the interest rates, bump up the interest rates, bump up the interest rates. And then when inflation stops and start to fall down, then we're going to cut back on the interest rates to kind of find that happy medium. I think he's going to land the plane softly because the Fed today, doing my history reading, my latest book is called Trillion Dollar Triage. Um, reading my latest books and watching what the Fed did back in the day, the Fed took a long time to react. Back in the day, it used to be something would happen in the economy and they had to vote on it, sit down and talk about it, whatever, blah, blah. Now, today, Jerome Powell is coming out every couple of weeks. He own it. He's reading that CPI report every month. That consumer price index that come in. Look at it. That is the in the book, The Trillion Dollar Triage that I just started. They talked about it. And The Trillion Dollar Triage is about that pandemic that came along that how the federal, how the president, the Federal Reserve, and the Secretary of Treasury had to come had to come together to save the economy. So the thing about it is we never act that fast. Jerome Powell was quick to pull the trigger back in March. We had a pandemic. He was like, interest rates, we're cutting them. We're sending out checks. Those checks came out so fast. It was just like, boop, 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 boop. Stimulus checks came out. Interest rates got cut. PPP loans went out just that fast. They went out so fast. It was scams going all over America. But we never seen the government act that fast in history. But they did it. So Jerome Powell is on top of shot. Jerome Powell. One day I'm going to sit down and interview you, Jerome Powell. You may not be the federal chair anymore, but I'm going to find you one day. I'm going to interview you. Maybe not right now while you're the sitting fed chair because you got too much going on. But when all this stuff comes down one day, I'm going to catch you out there in New York. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, I'll be out of New York next weekend anyway for a couple of things that you guys and girls to see. But I'm going to find you one day, uh, Jerome Powell. You know, uh, he's going to be on the show one day, whether you know it or not. So is uh, if so, where do I start? She said, do you do you know much about business credit? So first thing is you got to start a business. You got to start a business. Come up with an LLC. You know, you can use things like LegalZoom, start an LLC or S Corp, C Corp, whatever you want to do. Or you can use uh, one that I used a lot back in the day was direct incorporation. So you, you, you could do it on your own or you can go through a consultant. Me, I prefer to pay somebody three hundred dollars and get all my stuff done versus misspelling the word like I always do and messing up something. So first you have to start a company. Once you start that company, um, you're going to get your state license. Once you get your state license, get you a bank account. Once you have that bank account, you're going to have to go in and get your checking account, fund it with your own money in the beginning. 
Now, if you think you can just walk in and get a big old business line of credit, some companies might do that, but that probably won't happen. They want to see you build cash flow. They want to see you be in business for a while because if you've been in business for five or 10 years and you got some cash flow coming in, then people don't mind lending you money. So you got to, you know, you got to pretty much like building credit before a business. You got to in order, like take a child, take my son. If I want to build him credit, guess what? I had to get him an account. I had to put money into his account. I had to get him a credit card. So I put him on my credit card, right, to build his credit. So one day when he wants to go borrow money, that's what you can do. So then you get a, then you request a line of credit. Let me get a $500 secure business loan, right? You put $500 in this, show you're noteworthy. Then you ask for a line of credit for $1,000, for $2,000, for $10,000, for $15,000, $20,000, whatever you want to do. Then if it don't work out, you Donald Trump them and just file bankruptcy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Y'all remember when Robert Kiyosaki came on the show? He didn't like when I brought up that bankruptcy stuff. He was like, oh, Prince, why you bring that up? Why y'all always do this? But hey, whatever. Come on, man. Wealthy people do it all the time. Even though it was created for poor people, wealthy people don't want to use it. Dart says, do you think people will lose their job when forced recession? Of course, man. That's part of the... Um, yeah, people will be laid off. Companies will lay people off. I mean, it happens in every recession. Uh, an official recession is two months of a, I think it's two quarters of a declining GDP, right? Stocks are off a 20% high. That's why we went to the bear market. But yes, people lose their jobs. That's part of the game. You know, he said, I got lucky on my mortgage interest rate, made sure it was fixed. Dart, what, what did you get? Did you get a two? Did you get a two or three? What did you get, Dart? I like that Kermit thing, too. He got the dark Kermit. <laughs> I think it was the dark Kermit. I think he's trying to put it in. But it's funny. I like that. Uh, you know, that frog, you know, that frog was going, um, he was tearing up the social media for a while there. Um, uh, right here. LLJ said, maybe wages were good when your dad brought his house. Uh, no different ball game. Wages are not hitting on Jack. Yes. Uh, yes. You know, and you from my hometown. Um, I know you, uh, you from my hometown, you know, my dad, when he purchased, he, they, he built the house. They're still there today back in 95, you know, and he don't refinance so much now. It's crazy because, you know, he refinanced all the way down to like a 2%. So you got to think about it. People, when rent, interest rates was high, you didn't see people buy big houses. So the higher interest rates are, the smaller the houses were. When interest rates go down, people got bigger houses. When interest rates go down, you can get bigger houses. When interest rates are up, you have to get smaller houses. That's usually what I've seen. But yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Wages are not hitting on, you know, wages are not keeping up with inflation because inflation is going so much faster than wages. It's ridiculous. Okay. Dark Comer said he got over 3%. That ain't, that ain't too bad. I mean, it ain't a two, but hey, 3%, especially in this economy. Hey, man, that, I ain't mad at the shout out, Dark Comer, man. Congratulations. Congratulations on your home, too, man. I personally got a 275, and I was about to refinance for a 225. But I was a little slow. I kind of was like, ah, I'll get it in. I'll do it. I'll do it. And then as soon as I got all my paperwork in, man, that thing took off in the other direction and just ran. I was like, you know what? I'll keep my 275. <laughs> I'll keep it. And that's why I don't really want to get a rental property right now because I'm going to have to take a five. I'm going to have to put 20% down. I'm going to have to take a five or a six right now in this current economy, if not more. Um, and I think that with the interest rates going up and the housing prices going up, it's drying up that pool market. Wages are not keeping up. It's drying up that pool market, and we're still building houses. It's going to be less buyers, more inventory. That's what's going to start to hopefully don't collapse the housing market, but that's what's definitely going to cool it off. And I don't want to be in that market right now. The Opinion Sports Show. What's going on, Opinion Sports Show? He says, how does the Fed raise interest rates and keep the market from crashing upwards of 50%? I mean, that is kind of hard to do. When you raise interest rates, asset prices drop. So you got to think about the Federal Reserve is doing two things. They are doing two things. Remember, they are trimming their balance sheets. They are selling assets off of their balance sheets and they're lowering interest rates. Y'all got to remember that. Remember, Jerome Powell said this. I'm going to start uh, trimming the asset sheets. We're going to shrink our asset sheets. They're selling, you know, back in the day. It's part to boost the economy. They dropped the interest rates and they pumped billions of dollars into the stock market. Now they're taking those billions of dollars out of the stock market and raising interest rates. That all of a sudden, everybody knows that is going to bring down stocks. But people want it to happen. We don't need inflation to go too high. It's going to bring down asset prices. 
That's what they are designed to do. So, yes. So to do both at the same time, that's what Max B was saying. Can you land the land? Can you land perfectly? That means that you kill inflation, but keep asset prices going up. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if he got the skills like that. But right now, you got to think about it. They are shrinking the balance sheet. They're selling assets off of the balance sheets and they are raising interest rates at the same time. So this is the time everybody should be talking about stocks, not last year when everybody looked like a genius. Let's talk about it. Let's see. Lewis Free said, can you explain leap options? Leap options is buying an option like two years down the line. A leap option is saying, hey, guys, I want to go to 2022. I wish you'd ask me this question when I had the option chain pulled up. I want to go all the way to 2025 and buy a call option on Apple at 160. It's just a call option just way out there, just, you know, way out there to the right years and years in advance. Right. Some people go out and do it. And, you know, by the time that roll around, Apple stock might be way up in price and they make a bunch of money. So the opinion says, uh, he says, so with all the debt in the economy, wouldn't the S&P 500 go back below 3,300? Um, I don't know what the bottom is. I don't see 3,300. That'd be a little bit low. I think we're at, where are we at right now to be exact? Uh, we're at what, three, let's see here. I want to get up here and quote something wrong. Uh, where we at right now as of Friday we're at 3,000 okay I can see that going below 3,300 right I can see below 3,300 I can see that drop easy in a bear market all right but uh but okay I'm gonna finish up these courses and I gotta get running you know I gotta um run and run some errands and then I'm supposed to be putting some chicken on the grill so and I know my wife is waiting on me to do that too so let me get a couple more of y'all questions and I'm going to have to roll. But I appreciate y'all for tuning in. Make sure y'all hit that thumbs up button. And share this around. So Dark Kermit says, I was a gen uh, generous trader last year. Okay. Did I say that right? right? Did I say that right? Max B said, didn't the permits uh, and the start numbers for real estate just drop like 2%? A little bit. So what happened is the permits, you know, good. Max B, Max B, keep it on top of those reports. So right here, building permits. Building permits are a leading indicator, ladies and gentlemen. Building permits are a leading indicator. Before somebody can build something, they must have they must get building permits. So a way a leading economical indicator is when building permits started to slow off and drop off and fall off. That means that people are not building as much, which means that it could be a slowdown. But right now we got a low inventory, so we want to see those building permits go up by having building permits that low. And with a low inventory, that can keep the housing market at a low inventory and, you know, supply and demand. So the start numbers for real estate just dropped like 2%. It should be picking back up here soon because our inventory is low. Wayne says, how do they know how long the recession should last? Historically, they last about 18 months. Historically, recessions usually last about a year to 18 months. In recessionary periods, people just go off the paths of how it's done. But now the recessionary periods are getting shorter because they have more tools and they're quick to use more tools now than they were back then. E. Bolden, what's going on, E. Bolden? He said, I'm working on deleting my debt and investing in dividend stocks. Cool, man. Um, I don't know where you're at financially. If you got cash flow, what's your overall mission? So I can't really comment on that end, but I definitely uh, appreciate it. You know, I mean, that. Paying off your debt is never a bad thing. Um, paying off your debt, especially, you know, that's a guaranteed return on investment. And putting in dividend stocks, drawing you a income. But I don't know what else you got out there. I don't know your whole picture. But paying off your debt, creating uh, cash flow from dividends, not a bad thing. B Mac, he says, Prince, I listened to the audio book, The Psychological of Money by Morgan House. Great insight on the human mind when it comes to investing could people could help people stay strong during the market. You know, that's a good one. Shout out, man. That's a good gym. You just dropped there. So when it comes down to investing, you got three things. You got the technical, you got the technical investor. This is the person who watch charts, usually your day traders. 
Then you have the fundamental investor, more where I fall in the lines. You watch the cash flow, balance sheets, stuff like that. Look at what company is the strongest. Then you have the third option, which is um, behavior investing. See, when and markets are doing well, you want to invest more. When markets are doing bad, you invest less. Everybody, everybody try to pick the bottom. When the markets are going up, yeah, man, look, man, Tesla doing great. Let me buy some more, buy some more, buy some more. When markets go down, you're like, man, I don't know. I don't know. When it should be the opposite way around. It's easier said than done. So that's a behavior analysis. So that's what this book is, The Psychological. I have heard of that book. Uh, haven't read that one. Haven't got a chance to get, the, get to that one. But uh, it talks about that behavior analysis. All right. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to conclude my time today. I thank y'all for tuning in. Shout out to everybody. Round of applause to everybody that came in and supported the live. I got to get off this live. Make sure you hit that like, subscribe, comment, and share button as we are. Um, thank you, guys. Help me get to that 50,000 subscriber point. Um, I think we got to get to 48,000 next. I think that's the next little milestone there. Thank y'all for all the support. Check out the podcast. The podcast is anywhere you can get your podcasts. Check out my book series, Wesley Learns to Invest. Wesley Learns about credit. Wesley Learns about insurance. Available anywhere you can get books, especially online, in ebook, hardcover, audiobooks, all those good things. Hopefully, y'all got something out of this. I will be back on Tuesday. I have Adam Coffee. Adam Coffee is coming in, private equity guy. I'm going to start talking about private equity, getting you guys, exposing you guys into the private equity world. It's a book review of my latest book I read called The Private Equity Playbook. I'm very interested in private equity going into that space. The Private Equity Playbook, he wrote this book. I read it. I thought it was pretty cool. Reached out to him. He's coming on on Tuesday. Y'all stay tuned so for some more Do uh, of the Investor Show. Exclusive content is coming. Appreciate y'all. Thank y'all. Thank y'all for all the support. Y'all been a blessing to me. Thank y'all. So um, and to the next video, podcast, cartoon, or whatever else crazy you see me do around the globe, y'all already know my name is Prince Dykes. Peace. Be safe. I'm out. And thank you.